What? All right. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me get the lights and whatnot adjusted. A um, couple things. So we, we have a, a, a fair amount of housekeeping to unpack right now. Uh, fortunately, we're, we're well ahead of, of, uh, of schedule, so we've got a little bit of time. Um, there is a lot going on here, so I'm going to take my time and sort of uh, break it down with, with you all in terms of uh, the schedule for the next few weeks. So I want everybody to sort of pay attention to this. This is going to matter. Okay, so first off, um, let's talk about the homework schedule. Okay, so your homework two is going to be due on Tuesday, September 19th. Okay, now I'm not going to be here on Tuesday, September 19th. Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to be uh, heading towards the great state of Iowa. I have a, a, a presentation I have to make in Iowa. So we'll, since I'm not going to be here, class is going to be canceled. But what we're going to do is this. So I've got a cart, or obviously you, you all know about the cart outside my office. I put a box outside my uh, on the cart. This is CE Materials Homework 2. Just put your homework in the box between or before 12.30 when you would normally turn it in. I got a faculty who's going to come and collect them at 12:30, and uh, ultimately give them to the TA. So, everybody okay with that? Okay. So uh, let's let's keep going with the schedule. So, uh, like I said, homework two is going to be due on September the 19th. Does anybody have any questions about homework two? Um, I haven't really he uh, heard much feedback, and it, it's not a massive assignment, but it is somewhat hefty. I hope I hope that you've at least started it. Um, or at least taking a look at it. If this is a Monday night started at 9 p.m. assignment, it's going to be kind of hefty. Now, so everybody's clear, uh, I want everybody to be aware of this. Homework two, you are going to turn in your data sheets from lab two. Homework three is going to be from lab three, the absorption lab that we did last week uh, and whatnot, and then lab four, what we're doing on Thursday. So everybody clear on that? Okay, let's talk about homework three. Now, um, because, now tip, what my plan was, my plan was to uh, give that to you all on September 19th, but I really didn't think there was a big deal in just giving it to you today. Homework three is very short. There's literally just three problems. One of them is a blending problem. We all did that together, uh, the, I think in last lecture, or maybe the one before, I uh, can't quite remember. But we've done a, a blending uh, example. And then the rest of the assignment is just turning in the remainder of your aggregate lab. So this is an incredibly short assignment. Didn't really see a big deal in giving that to you all right now. Okay? So I went ahead and posted that today. It is due um, September 26th uh, at the beginning of lecture. Everybody okay with that? Okay, now let's talk about lecture. Okay, so today. We're going to finish out all of our discussion on aggregate. That, that's a, that's going to be a given. Um, depending upon where we get, uh, we might start talking a little bit about Portland cement. I don't want to get in too much detail with Portland cement because Portland cement is exam two material. And since we're well ahead of schedule, there's really no rush to get into it now. So we'll, I'll touch on what I think uh, is, is important at a 30,000 foot view. And then we'll probably be talking about cement later. Okay. Now, with, uh, between where we're at in lecture and with my, my travel uh, next week, uh, it, we're actually not going to have much lecture for the next uh, couple weeks. And let me explain what's going to happen. So today, we're going to talk about aggregate and, and maybe Portland cement. On Thursday, we don't really need to lecture, but I got to thinking, and I should have done this last week. It was kind of silly. Why did we wait till 2 o'clock to start the lab? Why don't we just start the lab at 1230? So, we're going to start the lab at 12.30 on Thursday, so that means we'll get out of here earlier. Let's, do you want to start the lab at 2? No. Uh, okay, now, that, now everybody's engaged and attentive, you know. Gives you more time for all that homework, right? Yeah. Some of you didn't hear my, my, my fluids pun a little earlier. Said, said, you know, if I come in, everybody's all worried about this, this, you know, all this stuff going in there. I can sense a lot of surface tension going on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So on Thursday, all right, all right, so let, let's get let's get serious again. So on Thursday, we will begin again in here, and that's going to be our lab. You know, unless otherwise noted, that's going to be our lab procedure. We're going to start out in here. At the very least, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lab on Thursday, but at the very least. 
we need to have our little safety powwow each week before we go into lab. So we're going to, we're going to, I mean, unless otherwise noted, we're always going to meet in here before lab. So on Thursday, we will start at 12.30. The only reason why um, I'm starting lab at 2 o'clock, uh, and, and that's my plan right now, is to start lab at 2 o'clock next Thursday, is because coming back from Iowa, I land like super late. So I'm probably going to be, you know, somewhat groggy. And since that's our first cement lab, I might need some time to prepare that. So right now the plan is next Thursday to begin at 2, but I might send you all an email and say, what the heck, let's just meet at 1230 as well. So, but but I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Right now the plan is, is for that lab to begin at 2. But everybody clear on two days from now, we're going to meet in here, 1230, and just do lab right then. And if we finish it 2 o'clock or something, then we're done. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. So that, that's, that's another point. So we're, we're not going to need to lecture on Thursday the 21st either because, like I said, we're, we're well ahead of where we need to be. And we'll probably cover enough that, uh, of what we need to cover with cement just talking about it today. Our cement lab that we're going to do on Thursday is very prescribed and very straightforward. There's really not a lot to it. There's only two things that we're going to do. We're going to cast some cement cubes and then do a VICAP penetrometer test. It's pretty straightforward. So. Um, the, big, the big labs that we do with cement are not really the cement labs, they're the concrete labs. And that'll be well after the, uh, the first exam. Any questions about that? Okay, now let's talk about the, the 26th and the 28th. Okay, so the 26th um, is going to be our exam one review. So if you've never had me for class, let me explain how I do my exam reviews. I'm going to come in and I'm going to produce a PowerPoint that'll have you know, some bullet points on what's going to be covered on the exam, what you need to study, you know, and so on and so forth. I let you all make your own formula sheet. You can sort of really do whatever you want with that, uh, except for worked out examples, but we'll, we'll get into that as we get closer to the exam. But on that Tuesday, I'm just going to sort of shut up and let you all ask whatever questions you want about the exam. If we're here for 10 minutes, we're here for 10 minutes. If we're here till 2 o'clock, we're here till 2 o'clock. It's really up to you all because I don't want you coming into the exam like uncomfortable or nervous about the you know, testing procedure and stuff like that. I want you to feel as confident as possible. So on uh, Tuesday the 26th, that's all you. Now you all have a homework due that day that is going to be covered on the exam. So when you turn in that homework, I'm automatically going to upload the solution to Blackboard. So you'll have that. I mean, I, we can't grade it immediately but it is going to be covered on the exam. Although this homework really isn't that big of a deal. There's just a blending problem and then your labs and that's it. Really homework one and homework two are going to comprise the bulk of uh, what's covered on that first exam. Sound good? For the exam day, let me, let me mention uh, real quickly what's going to go on with exam day. So I've reserved this room, not just for, you know, obviously our class period, but all the way through lab. So on this exam day, um, we have some cement cubes that we're going to cast in the lab before that we're going to test. Yes? Um, go ahead. Why don't you ask a question about the exam day? All right. Well, well, give, me, give me one second on this, I, and I'll get there. Okay. So on the exam day, we have some cement cubes that we're, that we're going to test. Bless you. Um, that, that we're going to test. And my, my plan is this. We're actually going to test these first so that we go ahead and get that out of the way. And then that gives you the rest of the time between then and like, essentially until 5 o'clock to, to do the exam. Relax, the exam is not going to take that long. But I don't want there to be a time crunch. And we might as well get this out of the way first. Because if you finish the exam first and then you, know, you finish it last, you're going to have to sit there and wait until we do the cube testing. But if we do the cube testing first, then do the exam, it, it helps out with everybody's schedule a little bit. Okay. Well, um, uh, well, there, there's, a, there's a couple barriers to that. If, if well, we can discuss that, I'm easy to get along with, but there's a couple barriers to that. First barrier is, I mean, there's going to be blending of aggregates on, on that exam, and you won't get the solution back until after. Unless, if you want me to move the solution date, or the, the submission date up to the 21st, we can do that if you want. Right? That's fine. I mean, it's up to you all. 
Um, there's nothing preventing us. I mean, we can adjust homework three to have it submitted on the 21st. We can do the review on the 21st and then do the exam on the 26th. We can do that. I don't think the exam will take more than 75 minutes, but if you did need a little bit of extra time, it's going to be a little tougher on Tuesday. What, what, I mean, I'm, I'm easy to get along with. What do you all think? That is true. What do you think? Y'all want to move it? Okay. All right. So. No, that's fine. That's why we do this. And again, we got time to, to discuss this. Okay. So. All right. All right. So here's what we'll do. Okay, we're still, all right, here's, here, there is one disadvantage. All right, we're going to have lab and lecture on the same day, so we will be here for a while on the 21st. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll do cement lab, or here, let's do this. All right. We'll do exam one review. And cement lab. We'll do exam one here. Um, this will this will be due this day, and we'll do that. Is that what you wanted? Oh, what's funny? Okay. I tell you what, let's do it. Um, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. We'll, we'll be back for exam review. The exam review, uh, we'll meet at 1230 and we'll go ahead and just, we'll make it work. Is that all right? We'll make it work. No. <laughs> In fact, if you want, I can leave this up here for a second if you all want to write this down or, or you know, hold on. This is too easy, man. <laughs> Everybody okay with this? So let me, so, oh, so that means this is due in case you couldn't tell th these sort of announcement PowerPoints are sort of my journal for, or the diary for the class, if you will. So everybody's okay with that? Yes. So I'm going to have to change the, the due, well, I'm not going to change the assignment. Maybe I'll just leave it as is. But everybody's in agreement that that's going to be due on the 21st, right? Any questions? Did I get the sign-in sheet passed around? Can't remember. Okay. All right. So. Going, any, any other questions? Going once? Going twice? All right. I'll just have a, a, a monster or something that day. I'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Don't, uh, I can't do this. Don't say I didn't do nothing for you. Okay. All right. Um, real quick, uh, I do want to go ahead and mention homework one. Um, I, uh, I haven't gotten the graded assignment back from the TA. So uh, I'm supposed to get that back on Thursday. But if you look on Blackboard, the solution should be posted. Is anybody on Blackboard? And can they see if the solution is, is uploaded? It should be, there should be a folder called Old Homework Assignments. And you should see it in there along with the assignment. Um, now, since I haven't gotten the graded assignment back, I don't really know much of what I can say in terms of comments. But if there are any big comments, I'll just go through them on Thursday. 
but the solution is present on Blackboard, so you all, it's uploaded, okay, all right. So you all just go through it, you know, at your leisure, and then we can talk about it in more detail on Thursday right before our lab. So we'll come in, I'll distribute the homework, we'll do our lab, and that'll be that. Any questions? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Um, so today, uh, let's talk about content. So today I want to talk about, uh, uh, I want to sort of finish our discussion on uh, blending of aggregates and calculating properties associated with blended aggregates. I'm going to take a little bit of time on that because there's a couple things that might be a tad confusing and I want to uh, go through those in significant detail. And then depending on where we're at, we'll uh, entertain a little bit more of a uh, uh, significant discussion on Portland Cement. But let me, um, let me start back here. So, uh, and actually I might go back a little bit. Okay, so um, if you recall, um, what we did last time was essentially, uh, uh, the last time that we met for lecture is we discussed how to take two aggregates, essentially one aggregate that's a little too big and one that's a little too small, how do we take those aggregates and blend them together to uh, develop a, a new aggregate that meets the specifications that's been presented? And you know, the one that was in the PowerPoint slide was something you know, that was essentially an even blend, like 50-50. That's not what we got for this aggregate, was it? What we ended up going with, it was like 57 and 43 or 56, 44, something like that. So um, by blending you know, a certain portion of aggregate A and a certain portion of aggregate B together, you can develop an aggregate that meets the specifications for your given application. For instance, this uh, spec limit might be something for a, uh, uh, a given concrete application, and if, again, if your two aggregates that you have don't meet, blend them together in a certain proportion so that they will meet your specification. Now that presents a, an additional challenge. Um, if I know the properties of aggregate A and I know the properties of aggregate B, well, what are the properties of the blend? You know, and, and those properties are going to be very significant if you want to uh, use these aggregates for things like uh, concrete. For instance, when, you, uh, when we learn how to do concrete mix designs, you're going to need things like a fineness modulus and a specific gravity and, and absorptions and so on and so forth for um, a coarse aggregate and a fine aggregate, and, uh, et cetera. If that fine aggregate that you're using for, uh, if, you're, if that fine aggregate you're using for that concrete was the result of a blend, well, you're going to need the fineness modulus of that blend, the absorption of that blend, the specific gravity of that blend, uh, and et cetera. So first off, if it's anything other than specific gravity uh, or density, and I'll explain why that is, because um, <clears throat> specific gravity and density are a little unique because of the way that we compute them. But other than these two, you can compute the property of a blend by just using the, the approach to show it's just a weighted average, right? So what we did here is we had stockpiles of, uh, two stockpiles of fine aggregate. And this was an example we did last time. Uh, we had two stockpiles of fine aggregate that had angularity values of 35% and, uh, and 70%. So this would work for angularity values, for, for, for fineness modules, for anything like that. Uh, and we blended these together by weight. Uh, such that we're using 40% of A and 60% of B, what's the percent angularity of the blend? And it was just a weighted average. And I think we got 56%. Is that what we got? Was that, that was pretty straightforward, right? Any questions on that? Okay. Now, one thing I, I want to be clear on is these are two stockpiles of fine aggregate. In other words, we've got these stockpiles of material and Dependent upon their different gradations, we are agreeing that these stockpiles are just fine aggregate, and that's it. Okay, one might be a, 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 a you know fine aggregate with bigger particles, and one might be fine aggregate with smaller particles. But in the end, we're we're considering that they are in fact fine aggregate. What if you just have a a stockpile of aggregate in general? So let's say I have a big pile of aggregate. It stands to reason that. You know, if it's just a general aggregate, it stands to reason that some of that aggregate might be coarse aggregate and some of it may be fine. Like if I just have a big pile of, of rock, if you will, some of it might be coarse and some of it might be fine. Well, 
if you um, if you want to compute the properties of a blend, you know you're using a weighted average for each aggregate. But if you've got uh, and you know two aggregates where some of it's coarse and some of it's fine, you have to account for that in the computation of the properties as well. So there's going to be uh, so the formula gets a, a little more complicated. It's not very difficult, I think. Uh, going through the example that we're going to see here in a second, we'll, we'll clarify this. But again, if you're calculating something like angularity or fineness modulus or something like that, if you're wanting to try and find some composite property, it is again a weighted average, but you need two, uh, two quantities, two fractions. So the first thing that you will need is your blend. You know, If you've got A and B, maybe you're using 30% of A and 70% of B. So those are going to be your, what I'm calling the big P values. The little p values are in regards to a given aggregate. So let's say I'm you know, using a little bit of aggregate A and a little bit of aggregate B. But if I look at aggregate A, maybe some of it's coarse and some of it's fine. Maybe, you know, maybe it's half and half. Maybe 50% of it is coarse and 50% of it is fine. So what these little p's are are the fraction of a particular aggregate that passes or retains uh, on a given sieve. So this is looking at just a single aggregate, how much of it is coarse and how much of it is fine. And this is going to be really important if you're trying to determine, let's say, something like a fineness modulus that would be more appropriate for a fine aggregate of a stockpile that's got coarse and fine aggregate uh, all mixed up together. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I think if it's a little fuzzy, don't worry. I think the example that we're about to do is going to clarify that a little bit. So, Let's say I've got two stockpiles that were blended uh, such that we had 30% of A and 70% of B. So those are the big P values. Okay, So those are the big P. So 30% of A, 70% of B. So I took a little bit of this, a lot of that, blended them together to make a given aggregate. Now I have a property associated with each one. Bless you. I've got a property associated with each one. Uh, Aggregate or stockpile A, it has uh, angularity values for the coarse aggregate that's 35%, and the coarse aggregate over here has 65%. Okay, so those are sort of my x values. But what I also need to know is, you know, if I look at stockpile A, how much of that is coarse and how much of that is fine. So if I'm looking at stockpile A, what I've got is we'll say about 40% of stockpile A is fine aggregate, and in stockpile B, 25% of it is fine aggregate. So the question is, what's the coarse angularity of the final blend? And I think you'll find, as long as you take care of your bookkeeping, this is a, this is a pretty straightforward problem. All right, so I might break out my notebook because I don't know if I have much room on that slide. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Let's start off looking at the blend. Okay, so when it comes to the blend, uh, the problem say that we put 30% of A and 70% of B. So mixing these two aggregates together, more came from the B pile than came from the A pile. Specifically, 30% came from A, so this is 30% and 70% came from B. Now these values have to add up to be 100%. So I'll say, you know, note P A plus P B equals 100%. Okay. Sound good? Okay. Now, what we're ultimately trying to determine uh, with this particular blend is we're trying to determine the angularity at the end. So what we need is the angularity of each individual um, of each individual stockpile. So let's look at the angularities. Okay. So these are going to be you know the actual properties that we're considering. So x sub a is 35% and x sub b is 65%. Now, these two values happen to add up to be 100%, but they are completely independent of one another. Okay? So I'm, I'm actually going to indicate that. I'm going to say, uh, you know, note x sub a 
and x sub b are independent of one another. That's a, that's a big deal. So this is literally just looking at stockpile A, paying attention to the course aggregate only, and asking yourself, well, how much of it's angular? How much of it's rounded? How much of it's sub-rounded, et cetera? And what we're saying is if we look at just pile A, 35% of it is angular. So pile B, it's 65%, but it could very easily be 55 or 40 or 10, or it could be anything, okay? They are completely independent of one another. Does that make sense? Okay, now, another point that I should mention and, and maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and add that here, is, is say this is angularity of the coarse fraction only. In other, in other words, come on, I can do better now. In other words, um, this x sub a and this x sub b value, those are angularity values paying attention to the coarse fraction, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, let's look at the fractions of each blend, so fractions. Okay, and this is going to be really important, so I'm going to, I'm going to write this out. Okay. So, note. Now, what we're looking for is the coarse angularity of the blend. Okay? So, in order to determine the coarse angularity of the blend, what I got to do is I've got to look at each stockpile and I got to ask myself how much of that stockpile is coarse aggregate, okay? So this is where you got to sort of pay attention to what's been given in the problem, okay? So, uh, here we go. So let's look at this, this bullet right here. It says stockpile A has a 40% fine fraction. So how much of stockpile A is, bless you, how much of stockpile A is coarse aggregate? 60%. How much of stockpile B is coarse aggregate? Everybody see that? So if I'm looking at stockpile A, if 40% of it is sand, then 60% of it is gravel. Does that make sense? Okay, so because we're looking for a coarse aggregate property, we need the fraction of the coarse aggregate in each stockpile. Since they gave us the fine fraction, it's 100 minus that. Everybody okay with that? So what I'm going to say, and, and I'm going to use sort of a little, like, therefore, and I'm going to kind of write my P like that. So PA is 100% minus 40% which is 60%. And then this is 100% minus 25%, which is 75%. I tried to make these look a little different than the big P's, so big P and little p. Everybody okay with that? So if you figured that out, it is very plug and chug. So therefore, the composite angularity or you know whatever property that you're looking for as long as it's not specific gravity p a little p a is that. Everybody kind of tell the difference between my, my big and little piece? Tried to 
differentiate, differentiate that a little bit. Now, when you plug these values in, these are percentages. Okay, so you have you have to convert these to your to your decimal equivalent. So instead of using you know if, if big P sub A is thirty percent, instead of using thirty, use the decimal equivalent, so 0 0.3. So so this one right here, this one is zero point three. All right, help me out. What's the little P A? Point four, point six. There we go. That bookkeeping. All right, what's X sub A? Plus, and then what do we have? P sub B. All right. Uh, we have, and then this one is. There we go. Okay, and then I can I can do this one because it's just the first two numbers. Zero point three. Oh good, I forgot to turn that off. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so somebody help me out. Plug and chug and tell me what you get. We'll say to three decimal places. I see these engineering students that didn't bring their calculators. All right, that's something, that something, there's something off in the cow. What's that? 0 0.573, do I have a second on that? Second, okay. You can tell that uh, with your the answer that you had, you can tell that that it's going to be off because because this, whatever the value is, it's got to be between two numbers, and that's 0.35 and 0.65, because this is the angularity value for stockpile A, this is the angularity value for stockpile B. So if, it, if one's 0.35 and one's 0.65, it's I don't care what blend the two, it's got to be somewhere in between that. Okay. And it makes sense that, I mean, let's look at the value. What do we got? We got 57.3%, right? That's a little closer to this number than it is to this number, right? But doesn't that make sense? I mean, how much of aggregate B went into the stockpile? We put a whole bunch of aggregate B, not so much in aggregate A. So it's, it, it makes sense that it's a little closer to that end. So your answer would be, or 57.3%. What do you mean? No, 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 no. Okay, let me let me go back. Okay. No, 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 no. First off, I'm not after a fine fraction in this problem. Make sure, make sure we're clear on the goal. What I'm trying to determine is the angularity of the final, uh, final blend, but the angularity of the, the coarse fraction. Okay? The reason why you wouldn't convert that is because this is just a composite property. Okay? We were given angularity values for the coarse component uh, 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 of each initial aggregate. You, you see what I mean? It really wouldn't make sense because the, what we're doing is this. Here's what we're doing. We're taking angularity values for the coarse fraction of A and the coarse fraction of B and determining a composite angularity for the blend. See, it wouldn't make sense to just say 100 minus that because the fine uh, portion of A and the fine portion of B might have completely different angularity values. So, you know, it might not be as simple as, well, you know, 57.3 so 100 minus that. It could be completely different. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? That's a good question, though. Any, any other questions? This is good stuff. Everybody good? Now, like I said, these are weighted average approaches, okay? And these weighted average approaches are what you can use to determine composite, just about any composite property of a blend. You got aggregate A, you got aggregate B, mix them together to come up with a blend. If you need properties of that blend, weighted average. However, there are two properties that you cannot compute this way. 
and they are specific gravity and density. Okay, and there's a very specific reason why, and I'm going to show you that uh, here. Okay, now first off, here here's the formula. The formula looks a little different. If you want to determine specific gravity or density, okay, if you want to determine specific gravity or density of, of two or more stockpiles, then you have to use the following relationship. Okay, so it's a little different. It's not just, you know, a percentage of one plus a percentage of two. You're, you've got this sort of inverted fraction uh, relationship. And um, now, now let me be clear, the, the, the fractions, all that stuff, that's, that's still the same as before, and the properties are the same as before, but our means of computation is a little different. And I think the easiest way to show you that is to actually just sort of go through the math. Now, we can do this for specific gravity or density. You'll get the same answer. I'm going to show you for, um, for, for density and, and also for, for unit weight. Uh, I'm going to show you for these, uh, you know, show you how the derivation goes, and I think you'll kind of see where this is headed. So I, I actually want to walk through this with you to make sure everybody kind of understands the, um, uh, understands the, 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 the math behind it. So, because if I give you just the verbal answer, oh, well, here's why, it's a little confusing. But if I just sort of walk through it with you, I think this will make sense. So, let's look at, let's look at unit, uh, unit weight. All right. How do we determine unit weight? Just super simple. Basic formula, how do you determine unit weight? If I've got a material, I take what divided by what? Well, that, okay, that, you're right, you're right. But I'm talking, that's exactly right, but I'm talking about, okay, let, let, forget water. I just have the material. What do I need? I need two quantities. I need a weight and I need a volume, right? It's weight over, that's, that's the fundamental definition of, of uh, unit weight. So unit weight is the weight over the volume. Would you agree with that? Okay. So let's say I've got two materials. So we'll say gamma sub A, which is the weight of A divided by the volume of A, and then the unit weight of B, which is the weight of B times the volume, or divided by the volume of B. Would you agree with that? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, my question to you is this. How would you determine the unit weight of the material as a whole. How would you do that? Well, I propose you take that divided by that. And what you brought up with specific gravities and water, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to approach, I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Okay. Would everybody agree with this? Okay. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little magic trick. J just bear with me. Would you agree with this? Would you agree with this over here on the side? Oh, come on. Yeah. Would you agree with this? Would you say that three-fifths is the same thing as one divided by five-thirds? Would you agree with that? Okay then would you agree with this? Would you agree with that? Okay. Would you agree with this? Would you agree with that? Not too bad, right? Okay. Let's keep going. I'm, I'm covering these formulas for a very specific reason because our next lab is going to involve some specific gravity computations. So I think it's appropriate to actually go through and explore some of these formulas so that everybody uh, feels comfortable with them. Now, this first fraction here, this VA, 
um, W A plus W B. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply that by the following. I'm going to put it in a different color. I'm going to do the same thing over here, but I'm going to do something a little different. Would you agree with that? Now, what did I do? I took each of these quantities, and what did I multiply them by? One, right? WA over WA is one. WB over WB uh, is one. That's not too bad, right? OK. Now, watch what I'm going to do. In this fraction, let's say I distributed this out. Do you agree that two times three is the same thing as three times two? So would you be OK if I just did that? Would you be okay if I just did that? Okay. Just bear with me. So if I do this, Oh, this isn't so bad. I can throw a derivative in there, though, if you'd like. What's that? All right. Everybody with me so far? OK. Now let's take a look at what we've got. Let's take a look at this part right here do better than that. Let's take a look at that. What is that fraction right there? Well, let's go up. Look at that, right? It's the inverse, right? So would you agree that if we, um, if we did that, that this term right here is 1 over the unit weight of A? Do you agree with that? Now, Let's also look at this. What is that? The weight of A divided by the sum of the weights. I would say that that is that. That's the fraction, right? 40, if, I, if I have two aggregates, right, and I use, you know, 25% of this aggregate and 75% of this aggregate, how do I determine that? I figure out how much the weight of A is divided by the sum of the weights total, right? Make sense? So I propose the same thing here, plus 1 over gamma B, PB, or Everybody okay with that? Now let me ask you this. I did this with unit weights. Would this derivation work with densities? What's the difference between density and unit weight? Gravity, right? Density is a weight per unit volume. Gravity, or, 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 or Unit weight is weight per unit volume. Density is mass per unit volume. Well, so what's the difference between weight and mass? It's gravity, right? So I propose that this derivation would work for density as well because the only difference is just the introduction of a constant, right? Multiply all these terms by a constant and it all gets factored out. Going to what you said, you were talking about well, what is specific gravity. Specific gravity is just a constant times the unit weight of water. It's the same, it's the same idea, okay? Does that make sense? So I propose that anything related to density, unit weight, or specific gravity, this would be the form or the relationship that you would use. Now I did this for two aggregates, or for yeah, two aggregates. If you did it for seven or eight or you know fifteen, it'd, it'd be the same process. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? So just so everybody's comfortable with the math. Um, 
Now let's just do a really quick one. I'm just going to make the numbers up. Uh, well, I, no, wait. No, I, I printed these off, so we'll, we'll just use this. Okay. So we'll say, quick example. So let's say, let's say we have the following blend. I feel like I'm being left out. Let's say I blended together four different aggregates to make a given uh, to make a given blend. Now we've only been doing two aggregates, but this will work for two, three, four, what have you. It, it doesn't really matter, okay? And let's say I'm looking at the following specific gravities. Now we're looking at bulk specific gravities, so just weight per unit volume. So, let's say I've got specific gravities of, let's say, 2.755, 2.699, 2.721, and 2.710. So, so, I've got four different aggregates that have specific gravity. So, first off, if I do the math, the answer better not be 4.86, right? It's got to be somewhere between these, regardless of what the blend is. Now, I propose that we've blended these to the following percentages. So, let's say 20%, 18%, 30%, and 32%. Now, do those quantities make sense just by themselves? Why? They add up to 100%, right? 18 and 32 will give you 50, 20 and 30 will give you 50, 50 and 50 gives you 100%. So they got to add up to be 100 and it's clear that they do so. If you want to find the specific gravity of the blend, so what do you have? You have 0 0.2 over 2.755 plus 0 0.18 divided by 2.699 plus 0 0.3 divided by 2.721 plus 0 0.32 divided by 2.710. Again, convert those to decimal equivalents. I'm doing this because I know you have a problem like this on your homework and I want to make sure you're comfortable with doing this type of computation. I think, if I remember correctly, I think this one is a lot more in, uh, computationally intensive than the one you have on your homework. So. I, I think your homework might have either three aggregates or maybe two. So if you can do this, you can definitely do the one on your homework. Two point seven two zero. Is that what you got? All right, do I have a second on that? Any questions on that? Good? Then, that's exam one. Everything past, uh, from here on out will be exam two. Everything from day one up until this, this is exam one. Exam one is going to cover all the introductory concepts that we covered and then aggregates. Okay? Everybody okay with, everybody okay with that? All right. Oh, I, we got plenty of time, so we're going to talk a little bit about some, so, some cement. Uh, we're not going to get too in-depth, and I even have a little movie, a five-minute movie. So everybody likes how it's made, right? So we got Engineers love how it's made, right? Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about cement. I, I, I do want you all to have a genuine understanding uh, of this type of stuff because you need to have a little bit uh, of understanding of this for when you do uh, concrete. Um, so. Right off the bat, you, you might be a little confused because you're like, well, what's the difference? You're talking about cement, you're talking about concrete. 
Um, first off, uh, it would help if this got plugged in. Well, it did get plugged in. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So first off, if there's any one thing that I hope you, you get out of this, uh, well, there's a few, that I, a few things I hope you get out of it, but if there's any one thing I hope you get out of it, it's that cement and concrete aren't the same thing. Okay? Cement is a, an ingredient that goes into concrete. Okay? This is Portland cement. Okay? I actually put together some in a jar and, and whatnot. I'm going to pass this around. You'll notice a couple uh, you know, uh, key components of this. First off, if you actually take a look and really start zooming into this, you'll see that or, uh, cement particles are extremely, extremely fine. I mean, we're talking about particles that pass through, you know, like the number 320 sieve, the number 400 sieve. I mean, these are incredibly fine particles, and they need to be because the finer the particle, the larger the surface area, and you need a large surface area because that large surface area in contact with water will create better hydration and ultimately create better cement. I'm going to pass this around, but, uh, you know, if you want just a visual cue of how fine the particles are, I mean, you... Uh, it, I mean, it's kind of neat, uh, kind of nifty. But if you just take this and shake it, you c you can look and you can see it's kind of cloudy in in the um, uh, in the bottle or in the jar because the particles are so fine that they're sort of like, you know, sifting down. So I'm gonna pass that around. Um, a, a couple things about a uh, cement. Um, you know, it or it's been around for a while. Um, you might, uh, why are you calling it Portland cement? Well, the name comes from the uh, limestone cliffs uh, from the Isle of Portland in England. Um, there are many different types of uh, cement, but because Portland cement is so, pre it's so prevalent, it, it's, you know, the main uh, type of cement that we use, most often than not, any time that somebody refers to cement, we're talking about uh, Portland cement. And by and large, what is cement? It's the glue or the binder, if you will, that makes concrete possible. Okay? And that's, that's really the, the, the main gist of, of why it is that we need to discuss Portland cement. So you all have a jar of that. You're passing that uh, around. We're going to, like I said, we're going to do a, a lab next week where we do some basic classifications of cement and mortar mixtures. Um, let me go through some terminology with you so that everybody is aware uh, of what's going on. So first off, um, I want everybody to be aware of the difference between some of the, the various uh, mixtures that you can do with cement. So if I, if I ever refer, first off, to cement paste, I'm talking about a mixture of cement and water. Okay? If I ever talk about mortar, I'm talking about a mixture of cement, water, and sand. Okay? If I have cement, water, sand, and gravel, throw them together, Voila, you've got concrete. Okay? Now, these are some typical uh, components that go into uh, uh, Portland cement. You've got four main comp or, or Portland cement concrete. You've got four, uh, essentially four main components, you know, gravel, sand, cement, and water. But you can also have uh, admixtures that go into that. And there's all sorts of admixtures for various different uh, 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 purposes, you know, things like super plasticizers, uh, accelerants, uh, retarders, and, and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about that. Uh, probably later on, um, but also air voids. Um, uh, depending upon your application, air voids uh, in a concrete mix are not only uh, necessary, they're actually desired, uh, especially if you've got uh, concrete that's going to be uh, subjected to an application uh, where you're going to have to deal with freeze-thaw cycles. Um, you like to have uh, a certain amount of air voids present in the concrete mix because as the element freezes and thaws, well, You've all had deformables, you know, uh, uh, elements that undergo temperature change like to either expand or contract. Oh, don't even, you know that from chemistry. <laughs> when things heat up, they expand. When things cool down, they contract. And those air voids sort of act as kind of like an internal buffer within the concrete to kind of uh, increase its durability, you know, uh, uh, Oh, come on, guys. Uh, increase its durability, um, uh, you know, remove uh, the, the major worry of, of thermal cracking and whatnot. So air voids uh, do tend to be somewhat desirable given the, uh, the application. Now, a couple things. Um, specific gravity of cement is always 
constant. It is 3.15. First off, these notes, I think they're online. If, if they aren't already, I will post them. There aren't any major examples in this uh, set of notes. There will be uh, later. Um, <laughs> specific gravity of cement is always uh, 3.15. That is regardless of whatever type of cement uh, that you're looking at. Now, the thing is, uh, bulk unit weight is, is highly uh, variable because, I mean, you can just sort of look at that and you can uh, see that the uh, presence of air voids inside that, just that, that, little, uh, that little jar uh, uh, can tend to be somewhat quite variable. So because of that, um, we don't uh, measure cement quantities by volume, but more so by weight. Okay, that's, that's the, the typical uh, measurement uh, 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 criterion. But, but um, when we start doing calculations, you know, um, when we start doing mix designs, we'll say, you know, okay, you need some initial properties to begin your mix design. So I'll say, okay, here's your coarse aggregate. Here's the, the specific gravity. Here's the angularity, and da 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 And then I'll say, here's the fine aggregate. Here's the absorption, the finest module, specific gravity, da 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 And then I'll say, okay, uh, here's the cement. And I won't give you the specific gravity of the uh, cement. Go, well, what's that? It's a constant. It's 3.15. So that's something to keep in mind. Everybody good? All right. Um, let's look a, a little bit at cement production. Again, it's how it's made. Who would, who would not want to watch how it's made? Um, I, ha I have this pulled up. It's a short little video, so I'm going to go ahead and let that play. Let's see. I hope it's not too loud. Many people confuse the terms cement and concrete. Cement is a fine gray powder that's used to make concrete. It's also an ingredient in the mortar that masons use to lay brick and stone. Cement also goes into soil cement, a material that's used in paving roads, building dams, and lining reservoirs. The action begins at the limestone quarry. The limestone near the surface has a high content of the minerals silica, iron, and aluminum oxide. Deeper down, the limestone is more pure, containing less of those minerals and more calcium carbonate. The plant uses both types of rock, altering the proportions to make different types of cement. Workers drill holes in the rock wall in which they plant powerful explosives. For safety, the workers have to position themselves behind the area they're blasting, maintaining a distance of at least 50 meters. After the explosion, loaders move in. They transfer the limestone rocks to 50-ton capacity dump trucks. The trucks then haul their cargo to the cement plant nearby. At the plant, the trucks dump the rocks into what's called the primary crusher. The rocks can be as big as a piano. The primary crusher reduces them to about the size of softballs. There's a constant spray of water to keep the dust from billowing up and settling on the chutes. From there, a conveyor transports the rocks to the secondary crusher. It reduces them further to about the size of golf balls. Rock high in calcium carbonate and rock low in calcium carbonate are crushed separately. Now it's time to mix the two. The ratio varies according to the type of cement they're making. This overhead machine called a tripper makes piles of the required proportions. They call this the raw mix. Then, a reclaimer loads the raw mix into a grinding machine called a roller mill. Depending on what minerals are already naturally in the crushed rock, the factory adds extra minerals, such as silica and iron. Certain types of cement also require aluminum oxide. The roller mixes and grinds the ingredients uniformly, producing a dry rock powder called the raw meal. Now the powder goes into a preheater. The temperature of the powder is 80 degrees Celsius upon entering. Within 40 seconds, it gets more than 10 times hotter. 
This begins the process of bonding the minerals together so that they'll later harden when hydrated with water. The preheater is equipped with what's called a flash calciner. In about five seconds, it removes 95% of the carbon dioxide and the powders through a chemical reaction. This isolates the lime, which is the most important element in cement. From there, the powder moves into a rotary kiln, a huge cylindrical furnace. It's set at an angle so that the powder moves from top to bottom a distance of 49 meters. The kiln rotates about two turns a minute to ensure the material travels through at the right speed. The burner's gas flame at the bottom reaches a scorching 16 to 1700 degrees Celsius. As the powder approaching it reaches the 1500 degree mark, it fuses into pieces about the size of marbles. These pieces are called clinker. As the clinker leaves the kiln, large fans cool it down to between 60 and 80 degrees Celsius. It's important to cool the clinker quickly in order to have quality cement. From here, the clinker goes to the storage area. The last stage of cement making is called finish grinding. They add some gypsum to the clinker. The precise amount varies with the type of cement they're making. Gypsum delays the cement setting time so that it can be worked for up to two hours before hardening. The cement mills are called ball mills because they contain metal balls, about 150 tons of them in the largest mill. As the mill rotates, the balls crush and grind the clinker and gypsum into a fine powder. All right. Okay. So, so um, let me be clear. I'm, I'm not going to require you all to, um, uh, you know, to you know, quote that verbatim. But I do want you to have sort of a general understanding of the the process of um, of, uh, uh, of producing cement. Now, it starts with two main ingredients, and and the video. Uh, really just sort of mentioned the limestone and the, uh, the, the um, uh, quantities of materials that came from the quarry, but really what you need are two types of ingredients. You need calcareous materials, so uh, 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 materials that are rich in uh, calcium oxide, so limestone, uh, chalk, things like that, um, and then also agrilaceous materials, so materials that are rich in silica uh, and alumina, things like clay and shale uh, and what have you. Now, the actual, I mean, there was a lot going on in the video, but in the end, the actual process for producing uh, cement is pretty straightforward. Um, you start off by, you know, mining and, and, uh, and collecting your uh, uh, two materials, crush them and, and grind them to a specific size, and run them through a, a kiln. And inside that kiln, the, the materials go through a, a chemical reaction. I'm going to sort of highlight some of those uh, here in a little bit to produce a, 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 a material called clinker. They, they cool that down quite quickly, um, add some gypsum to that, gypsum which sort of slows the, the setting time, grind it up a little bit, and there you go, you've got uh, cement. Um, in terms of transportation and, and, and handling, uh, uh, typically when you talk, uh, when you, when you talk about mix designs and whatnot, if you ever refer to a sack of concrete or, or a, a, if you ever hear a bag of concrete, a typical unit for, for, uh, 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 for cement um, is that one uh, sack of cement uh, weighs 94 pounds. And you'll typically see when you purchase uh, cement sacks or uh, bags, whatever you call it, I usually call it a sack, but a, a typical um, sack, and you can see some actually uh, in the lab, uh, in that uh, back bay area of the lab, each of those sacks weighs 94 pounds. And a 94-pound uh, sack is about one cubic foot of loose cement. Now you do the math, that's not really going to translate to a specific gravity of 3.15, but again, it, the, the actual unit weight computation is somewhat variable due to the high presence of voids uh, in a cement mixture. So I don't want you to say, well, 94 divided, that doesn't, that doesn't match. Well, it, it's not going to because of the voids. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I, I do not expect in any way, shape, or form that you all are, you know, we start, go, we're not going to get into stoichiometry or, or chemistry or, or, you know, 
uh, or, or stuff like that. So you know, no solid state chemistry or, or anything like that. So you know, there's no calculus or chemistry in here. So it's okay. It'll be all right. But um, what essentially happens inside the kiln is uh, by heating the uh, those two materials to a uh, a very high temperature, a, a chemical reaction takes place. The four main compounds that end up getting produced that become components of the clinker are tricalcium silicate, dicalcium silicate, tricalcium aluminate, and tetracalcium aluminoferrite. I can't believe I got that out so quickly with no slip-ups. I'm actually a little proud of myself with that. Now, <laughs> there are uh, those are the four major components uh, of clinker that once you add gypsum to that becomes cement, uh, magnesium oxide, titanium oxide, and so on and so forth. Uh, from a quantity standpoint, they're not uh, as, as, as big of a deal, but they're not small in importance. They all affect the, uh, the chemical reaction that then further takes place when you add water to cement uh, to create the bonding process. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, just you know, what ends up happening when you look at, uh, you know, at your end product. And there's numbers here that are going to seem kind of crazy, and, and the first time you see them, they are. Um, particle size is very important, okay? And like I said, if you actually take a good hard look at this, you'll find that the particle size, the individual particles of uh, Portland cement are very, very small, okay? And that's really important from a bonding standpoint. You know, uh, if I have, um, uh, you know, imagine this similar volume being represented by just marbles or gravel or something like that. While it might be the same volume, the surface area is going to be far lower. And more surface area means more potential room to come into contact with water, which is ultimately going to create a stronger bond for your you know, concrete mix. Now, uh, we can't get too fine. I mean, the, the finer you get, you know, it's going to increase the heat of hydration and increase the cost of production. So that's no good. So, but, so the long and short of it is, you know, if you look at particle diameter, or average particle diameter for uh, concrete um, or cement, uh, uh, production, you know, the maximum particle size is only about nine hundredths of a millimeter, or in U.S. units, you know, 0.0035 inches. About 90 percent of the particles would pass through a number 325 sieve. So we're talking about some really, really fine, some really small particles. In fact, this one's this one's uh, one of my. I, I, fi I find this really nifty. So if, if I had a one kilogram. Vol or you know weight of, of Portland cement of this okay it would have about seven trillion particles in it and if I computed the surface area of those particles it'd be about anywhere from 1500 to 2,000 square feet of area of just contact area and across the board that's that's a lot so just just to give you kind of an idea of scale is uh, in terms of what's going on uh, with uh, with cement now, obviously, one of the big uh, reactions with, uh, uh, that, that matters with, with Portland cement is hydration. Okay? Now, how many of you all have ever worked with concrete before, ever? Okay? What happens after a while when you start mixing the water and, and start saying, what happens to the concrete? It gets hot, right? But if, if, you've, if you've never experienced that, you know, when you work with concrete, you, you will. I mean, when you start setting concrete, concrete will get hot. And the reason why is because, you know, when you start adding water to uh, your cement mixture, a series of chemical reactions take place. And I've got, you know, primary chemical reactions here that, that happen during cement hydration. Again, I'm not, um, I am not uh, interested in your ability to recall these verbatim, but I just want you to be aware of them. The one thing, the one that I will point out is this one, uh, this one here in the, uh, uh, in the middle right here, the one with tricalcium aluminate. Um, and it's also, there's also when it uh, reacts with the, the gypsum. But when you add uh, the water, the water reacts with the tricalcium aluminate, and that's the reaction that ends up producing the heat. So if you want to know why, um, why that happens, well, it's because of the chemical reaction, but it's really the reaction of the tricalcium aluminate and the water. Those two coming into contact is what produces the heat uh, from, uh, from when you set uh, concrete. Everybody okay with that? Okay, um, let's talk about uh, what happens when you start adding water. So first off, you know, you're adding water to cement to develop, you know, again, when you have cement and water by themselves added together, we term that cement paste, okay? 
Now, the structure of that cement paste, I mean, it begins as soon as water comes in contact. As soon as water comes in contact, that reaction begins. Okay? And the cement paste is going to remain workable for a little under an hour, and then it's going to start to stiffen up and start to solidify. After two to four hours, it's pretty much going to be uh, essentially solid. Now, what happens is uh, the individual particles, they're going to hydrate, and when they hydrate, they form bonds with adjacent particles, and then that's where the, uh, the solidification comes into play. Now, what happens is if you start to test um, the results of, of hydration over time, and, and what you're seeing here is a, a, a graph showing the compressive strength of uh, a cement paste over time. So what I mean by compressive strength is this. In, uh, our, in our lab next week, what we're going to do is we're going to take this, mix it with water, and, and produce some uh, cement blocks. I might show you all those in lab next week. We've got a few of them left over. But the cement blocks are about, I mean, they're two inch by two inch cubes. They're about like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to take those cubes, we're going to put them in our uh, compression testing machine, and we're going to crush them or you know, load them until they fail, which is great. I mean, any day with controlled demolition is a good day, right? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to test those cubes at an age of about seven days. Uh, I say about seven days because, I mean, we'll do the lab and we're not going to act, it's not going to be you know, to the minute seven days, but it'll be close enough. Um, at around seven days, you know, we're going to get a compressive strength. If we held on to a few of those cubes and tested them, let's say, at 14 days or 21 days or 28 days, if we held on to them a little bit and tested them over time, what we would find is that those cubes would get stronger. And what I mean by stronger is this. I mean, you know, we're going to take this, this cube, right? We're going to load it until failure, okay? So it's going to crush, all right? So we're going to have a load. That cube's going to have an area. Load divided by area will give us the stress, right? Mechanics of deformable bodies, right? So stress equals P over A. My, my point is, is if we took that same cube, or you know, that same batch of cubes, we said, okay, we'll test some at seven days. Now let's wait another week. Let's test some at 14 days. Let's test some at 21 days. What we're gonna find is that as time progresses, that capacity is going to increase. The load that is required to crush that uh, cement pay, or that mortar block, uh, is going to go up. Now what ends up happening is, is that, you know, like I said, the, the, the strength will increase, but that rate of increase tends to drop off at about 28 days. If you've ever been around any type of civil engineering construction, have you ever heard the term 28-day strength? Have you ever heard that? Okay, if, you, if you've heard that, the, the reason why it's such a standard is because after about 28 days, the compressive strength of that uh, cement mixture the rate of increase tends to drop off uh, at around 28 days. So when we do a lot of civil engineering design, for instance, for, uh, if you decide to take uh, reinforced concrete design down the line, we're going to use the compressive strength of concrete as one of the fundamental values that we use to design beams and columns and slabs and so on and so forth. And that compressive strength is the strength of that concrete that we take at 28 days, because that's about when the rate uh, of increase begins to, uh, to teeter off. Does that make sense? So when we do our, our mixed design labs, the actual concrete mixed design labs, we're going to do two mixed designs and we're going to test our cylinders at seven days, 14 days, and 28 days. And we're actually track that throughout the semester, but that's not going to start till uh, a little bit later on. Everybody good? Okay. Um, one point that, that is definitely worth mentioning uh, and, and I, I, I kind of mentioned some of this uh, a little earlier. Oh, this is a perfect, it's actually a good time to stop because I don't want to get too heavy into this. Um, one of the uh, uh, very important parameters that will affect the capacity of not just cement paste, but, but, a, but a concrete mix uh, in general is the presence of air, okay, and the presence of air voids inside your uh, concrete mixture. Some of them are desirable. Some of the, you know, the, the air voids that are present in a mix are desirable. Some of them are not. Some of them are unavoidable. Some of them result from just chemistry and, and just the chemical reaction that takes place, and some of them are from a handling aspect. Um, this is where we're going to start to get a little more specific when it comes to cement, and we will um, worry about that down the line. I don't really think it's a big deal uh, right now. One thing I will mention is this. 
with our cement lab, we are going to have two primary experiments that we do. Um, okay. We're going to have two primary experiments that we do. I know we're running short on time, but I want to show you this real quick. One of them is going to be what's called a VICAT penetration test. So we're actually going to make a, um, a sample, uh, if you will, of, um, of Portland cement paste. And what we're going to do is this is a, a VICAT penetrometer uh, apparatus. And the idea is we're going to mold that cement paste inside this, um, inside this apparatus. And what you'll see is this is sort of, you know, you know, ap see, you know, you can see this sort of rod right here that comes down and descends. What will happen is we'll sort of hit go and that will descend. And this sort of apparatus will descend into the concrete and we'll be able to determine, you know, after a certain period of time how long it took for that uh, apparatus to descend into that cement paste. And what it will ultimately help us determine is the, the, the setting and the hardening time for that individual sample of cement, which is, you know, it's important. I mean, once cement gets uh, and concrete gets wet, you only have so much time before it sets. So you need to understand that time. That's where the lab experiment comes into play. I think this thing's going to end up needing new batteries. Um, but just, uh, I just want to show you this real quick and then we'll call it. This is going to be the second uh, experiment that we do next week. We're not going to do this this week. We're going to do this next week. But these are the uh, uh, the mortar cube or the yeah the mortar cubes that I was mentioning. We're going to cast a few of these. Wait seven days. Test them to get their compressive strength. It's a nice bit of practice for what comes later when we do our concrete labs. Sound good? All right. So Thursday we meet here when? Twelve thirty. All right. That's all I got. We'll see you.